as just measuring children's attitudes towards their mother really is kind of boring. But knowing that somebody has a positive attitude with their mother and is a happy person or is academically successful, that becomes interesting because it addresses the so what question. So what if you say you're high and love your mother? So what if you say you're low? What does that mean? It doesn't, it doesn't interpret itself. So path analysis is a way of saying, let's connect these things and see how they connect to each other. So we're now looking at the um, many journals really don't care about you measured something correctly or accurately or interestingly. What they care about is, so what does it mean? Now there are some technical journals that will publish new research instruments, but the American ones really won't care about all your Russian data or Azerbaijani data, they just don't care. Because if it's not between California and New York, it's not real. Um, and that comes from someone who lives and works in New Zealand who at least collects data in English, and they still don't go, oh, what is that? Go away. Um, yeah. I actually did a study on Australian teacher conceptions of assessment that went to educational assessment, and after three of your reviews, they went, well, this doesn't make sense to us. So rejected. Went back. Three rounds of yeah. One reviewer who was from the first, second, and third time said, This is good. The other reviewers went, Ah. Oh. So I sent it to an international journal, and they went, Okay, there's some problems you need to fix here, but we're interested. And then they published it. And it was actually a better journal than the first one. Yes, revenge. All right. So we're interested in the so what question. Now it could be that boys and girls are different, it could be that older and younger kids are different, it could be ethnic kids, it could be rich and poor kids, it could be city kids, country kids. That begins to unpack. That's kind of your analysis of variance of your measurement model. But what if you want to know how does this construct relate to something else? Well, we have to make sure we understand what we mean by relate, which is we're assuming there's a linear, it's a correlation, or a regression, and the two things are correlated, or two correlated things explain something else, or if I join these two things together, I can explain a third thing, or there's a chain that A influences B, which influences C, and so on. There's all these different relationships, and you'll hear words like moderation and mediation, and Sometimes it just gets into a really big, deep black hole of what people are trying to say. And there are techniques for moderation and mediation that were developed in the 1980s and 90s that you don't have to worry yourself about anymore if you use structural equation modeling or path modeling. You know, all that Barron and Kenny stuff, you can just skip right over that straight into structural equation modeling. Right, path analysis actually comes from the 1920s. Sewell Wright, the uh, agricultural researcher, had developed a way of saying, how do we model and understand influence, causation? So, path analysis is a special case of structural equation modeling because we only use single indicators rather than latent variables with multiple indicators. So, the logic is the same, it's just how much are you using. So, it does regression analysis, these are regressions, but you also get to keep the residuals, the error and the error, and you get to keep a correlation, like this, these two are correlated. So this is why it's better than correlation analysis or regression analysis. It's a way of keeping everything together. And we can put in a mediating variable, like 
this goes through here, this goes through here. So this is the partial deviation because there's still a direct path. So you can build all of these models to represent how you think A gets to the end. It's also pretty much a little more useful for small samples because now you only have four variables. So four times 10, 40 people, 50 people, it could probably work. Whereas if you have five items for each construct, 5, 10, 15, 20 items, you want 200 people to estimate that accurately. So depending on your sample size, you could do a factor analysis of this construct, reduce it to a single scale, reduce it to a single scale, reduce it to a single scale, and then join them all up it is a way of handling, I don't have many people. Okay, so you do the separate measurement models, four measurement models, and then you create the scale scores, and then you do the path analysis. Life can be easy even if you have a small sample. The rules. Rules that Sewell Wright developed are really important for us. You can trace backward up an arrow and then forward along the next, or forwards from one variable to the next, but never forward and then back. Okay, so that's the recursive rule. You can go this way, you can go this way, you can't go back here. You can go forward, you know, like you can't go in a circle. Okay, I mean that should be like, duh, but some people, oh, they believe in reciprocal causation, so they want to go, yes, and then this influences this. Not in one model, thank you very much. If you want to capture that, you have to go longitudinal. You have to collect data over multiple time periods to show the connection of how this folds back to influence this. You know, so you get people in education full of these, oh, it's all circular, and they want to do it in their model, which violates the rules of the model. So. You can't go back. You can go through each variable only once. So I could go this way, this way, but I can't go here again because I've already been there. So I can't go back through that, right? I mean, it's all kind of very logical. No more than one bi-directional arrow can be included in each path chain. So there's one bi-directional arrow. It's a correlation. There's a correlation, so you can't suddenly have another correlation here or somewhere else, you know. The model has no feedback loops, right? So there's nothing that brings it back. The directed graph of the model must contain no cycles, and it is what Judea Pearl calls a directed acyclic graph. Directed because it has direction. A is the prefix meaning no, so acyclic means no cycles inside the model. Nothing goes here, 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 and around and around and around in a loop. That way lies madness. It's not a structural equation model because it's no longer recursive. So, different kinds of path models, we've developed terminology to help people understand the design of the path model. This is a bivariate path model. This is con structure content time one, structure content time two, structure content time three, and this is style time one, style two, style time three. So those are two variables, the same variable repeated. So it's bivariate. It's also, we use the word autoregressive, because this is the time one, it predicts itself at time two. The word auto means self. It regresses on itself. And what autoregressive chains do is that the Generally, the correlation 
the first correlation is stronger than the second correlation, which is stronger than the third. As the chain goes on, the power of the relationship weakens. That's what we mean by autoregressive. Why? Why? Because the influence starts at time one, and the further it gets away, the less influence time one has. Ah, you mean in the uh, correlation with time one to eight? So, no, this path will get weaker over time because as it goes along, other things not in the model start interfering with this regressive relationship. So, auto-regressive. Just think about it, your own life how you were at age 10, influenced strongly you age 11, and age 11 then influenced you at age 12 and 13, and then as other things happen in your life, maybe your academic scores don't get explained by how good you were at 11, because now you suddenly got excited, or you got a girlfriend and you stopped paying attention, and you know, things interfered with your life. This kind of relationship, where one variable affects the other variable at the next time point, is called cross-lagging. And it's lag because it, it's not here, it's at the next time point. At the next time point. So it's variables can affect each other but not simultaneously, we're talking about at the next time point, at the next time point. So there's, when you look at a model like this, you should be able to, okay, that's a bivariate, re auto-regressive with cross-lagging. What is it like in between? Well, in this case it is, it's over time. But this time was two hours and this time was ten weeks. So it's not like it's a constant unit of time. And that's part of the reason why the regression might get weaker over time. This is one of the things that the path models, if you go back to this path model, here is a mediated path model. These two things predict that with some influence of this thing. So path models can be of many, many different kinds. This is an example of an autoregressive cross-lagged model. Moderation and mediation. God, I, I, I hate the people who invented these things because <laughs> it's always with them. So you've got a, a variable. So, predictor, predictor, moderate. So you've got a predictor and a moderator. What is a predictor and a moderator? Uh, Sex can be the moderator, for example. Men and women might behave differently even though they have the same score on this predictor. Uh, a boy with a high score on this might be different to a girl with a high score. And then there's the interaction. So you have the sex effect, you have the predictor effect, and then you have the interaction. Or you could just say, well, let's model it this way. One of my colleagues, he's a computer science guy, and he had an independent variable. He randomly assigned students in his class to one of two conditions. So zero, you were in the control. One, you were in the experiment. So there's your independent variable, zero and one. In the experiment, they got gamification version of the software. You know, smiley faces, stickers, scores, all that kind of stuff. And the ones without, that were in the control, didn't get that. And then there was a dependent variable, your score on the course. Okay? For people without the experiment, this is the baseline path. This is what we're comparing against. Does going this way through the experiment make any difference to the score. And so he ran this model and he said, what do the numbers mean, Gavin? He said, well, if you were in the experimental condition, you created 22 more test questions 
in the game version of the software than if you weren't in the game software. And it added so many points to your total test score compared to people who didn't go in that. Because you didn't. They just, well, what, what, how much would you get? What was your score if you didn't get that? And so he was able, oh, okay, now this makes sense. And he, so he's presented it at Computer Human Interaction Conference and got a prize and blah, blah, blah. He's a really nice guy. It's the uh, system called, I don't know if you know it, PeerWise. It's a way of, it's a free software. It's on a cloud, open to use for anyone without charge. And it's a system that says, if you want students to learn things, it's really good if they make test questions. And then they answer other people's test questions. That will help them learn the material. Testing is a learning technique. So he gets, on PeerWise, students create test questions, multiple choice test questions. There's a correct answer. Students do it. They get told if they got it right or wrong. If they think it's a bad question, they can comment. If they think it's a good question, they can comment. And after a while, you get to see students write, serious students who tend to write questions and take other kids' questions, other classmates' questions. This is a way of saying, am I learning what's in this course? It's a nice little technique. I use it for students to learn how to write multiple choice questions. They write multiple choice questions and other people attempt them and then comment them. Why did option C and D look the same to me? Are you sure they're really different? And when they finally do their final assignment, their multiple choice questions are much better because when you write a multiple choice question, you can't see what's wrong with it. Because it's my baby. If I wrote it, so of course it's good. But when someone you read someone else's, you go, what a stupid question. That doesn't make sense. And so, peer review helps you. So that's why we called it peer wise. Being wise through peer interaction. Moderation is an interaction between the independent variable that, in, that influences the dependent variable. The cross product of the two independent variables are added to the regression equation. So y, my score here, is equal to my starting point plus the weight of x1 plus the weight of x2 plus the weight of the interaction of x1 and x2 plus noise, right? That's what the regression equation looks like. And if b1, b1 can only be explained if b2 is zero. Part of the problem is there's uncertainty in this equation. It's not fully identified. But when B2 is zero, then the equation is identified. Mediate influences how the independent variable relates to the dependent variable. If the influence goes through the mediator, without the mediator, the influence of the dependent variable would be much weaker or non-existent. So this is how we would test conceptually a mediator. And if this has no effect, then it's unmediated. If it has partial effect, it's partially mediated. And if this is zero, then it's fully mediated. That's what the regression equation is. So if you can write that regression equation in on a piece of paper, then you should be able to write it in Levan because you know how to write an equation, a regression. Right? The answer is equal to tilde this variable plus this variable times plus this variable times that variable. And the error is automatically inserted. Right? Does it sound plausible? Then you get things like moderated mediation. That this relationship is moderated by this. That's a moderator on the mediator. What a nightmare. <laughs> and I found this on the internet, a moderated mediation. So, contact, negative view of police. So this is a relationship between your race, white and black, for example, in America. Whether you, how much contact you've had with the police, 
how good was the contact you had with the police, whether you think police are evil bastards, or whether you think, oh, sure, I like being around the police. The policeman makes me feel safe and he'll help me if my, my kid is lost and, you know, that kind of positive thing. And there's all these, whoa, fancy. So it's really, does race matter to this? That's the fundamental question. But maybe it depends on how you interact with police. Have you ever met a policeman? Well, if you've never met a policeman, then maybe your beliefs are wrong. But if you, and was that a positive experience or a negative experience? So you can see why this might mediate the ra role of race to how I look, think about the police. And what they've done here, it says if you have your identity, I'm a proud back black man, I'm a proud white man, you know? You, what, is that, what is that movie about being a proud black man? The, uh, Wakanda, um, oh, come on. Black Panther, Black Panther, proud black man, you know, I have a strong identity versus I have a low identity, and so, 49 if I have a high identity and 26, negative 26 if I have race, explains, quantity of contact, I meet the police too much, I don't like them. And on the other hand, the quality of contact is probably worse if I'm black. Let's assume that's what it means. And, but the quality of the contact shapes my desire to be close to the police. Clearly, if I've had a positive experience, I don't hate the police. Oh, they really helped me. They were nice. They didn't shoot me. <laughs> on the other hand, this reduces the negative view of the police. So if you have positive contact, you don't hate the police. If you have lots of contact, it also reduces your desire. Oh man, those police are everywhere. They're always stopping me and frisking me and hassling me. And you have a neg don't want to be near the police. And just if you're black or white, what is this? Plus 42, negative view of the police. So I'm assuming positive here is being black. And negative 42. They cancel each other out, basically. But if you have a high identity, it's really negative. Power to the black man, you know, that kind of view. Yeah, I'm proud. I want to be, yeah, man, I hate those police, man. Don't want to be near them. They can't be trusted. And in America, Black parents teach their black sons and daughters that when they get stopped by the police when they're driving, they park the car and they put their hands outside the window so they don't get shot for being driving while black. Too many guns and too much hatred. Right. Oh my God, look at this syntax. Okay. To create a bifactor, so here's our bifactor model, plus I've created two new factors from, in that data set, there's an assessment checklist. When you think of assessment, which ones do you think of? Tick, 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 tick. So here's the assessment checklist. I've made sure that the specific factors are not correlated with the general factors. And I've correlated check one with check two because they're the same thing. I've correlated bad with those three, imperial with improvement with those three. So those are correlated and these are correlated, but it's not correlated here. Because I'm interested in creating a path model, I need a single variable for each of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. And here it is with a technique called Bartlett. It's a regression equation technique for creating a single score by using the weight of the regression of the items on the factor. And we have to switch to SEM, not CFA here. SEM, it gives a slightly different estimator. Bad is equal to this, <coughs> data equals. Factor score for bad is equal to this command, predict, 
that fit value, factor score, true, method, Bartlett. And then it's going to create the score somewhere and store it. And then you do that for each of these scales. And then it's, that creates the factor scores, which you then have to regress. So it carries on. To create a data frame, oh my god, now we have to do a whole bunch of other stuff to make this work. Factor score data is created from the data frame bad equals fs bad, improve, la 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 la. So now we've got a data frame of factor scores. So you've now got a matrix of one, one factor score for each factor for each person. And you save it. And I had I couldn't make it work this way. Dimitri and Maxime might find a different way to do it. So I saved it as a CSV file and I called it a name. So then I brought it back in. Because what I found is just creating the data frame and using R Studio to bring it in it didn't work. There's some hidden codes inside Haven that doesn't work right. So I solved it by writing it as a CSV file and bringing it back in as a CSV file, and it works fine. But it's a pain in there. Path model. Now I'm going to create a map path model with this uh, Bart Bartlett Scoas. Check one and check two are explained by general. Check one and check two are explained by bad. Check one and check two are explained by affect. Explained by improvement and explained by external. So that's a very simple model. These two things are explained by these other things. And maybe there was a more efficient way of doing it, but this way I can see what I've done much easily. The specific factors not are uncorrelated. So general is not correlated with this. Check is, check is correlated. So this is uncorrelated, but this is correlated, and these are correlated. Fit the model, again it uses the SEM rather than CFA. Model equals path data is show the output, show the fit, show the diagram. So this is what I'm getting. The regression. Standardized values, 53, 45, 0, not significant. Maybe I don't need this path. 28, not significant. Maybe I don't need that one. 21, 22. So some of them are reasonably strong, like these first two. And the rest are, those are moderate. And the rest are kind of small or not close to 0. There's the covariances, there's the zeros, and there's check one, check two, 98. Whoa, maybe it's just one thing. I'm not going to worry about it right now. Highly correlated, negative, zero, not where is it? Not significant, not significant, moderate. And this is what the picture looks like. Check one and check two are correlated. And each is explained by the five predictors, four, four unique factors and one general factor. And it should have some zeros up there. And the numbers are here, it's so tiny I can't read them. But fortunately they're here, and I can read them. Oh, those are the variances, the regression weights were here. Those are the numbers that are in that diagram. So, check one is explained by general 0.53. Okay, the general explains why you chose those scores. Check two, pretty strongly explained by general. So the uniques are not doing very much. It's the general that's doing something. And maybe you could change some things, especially now that you know these two are not significant. And that's not significant, so you might want to go back and tweak the model and say, let's set some of those stuff to zero and see if it's any better. And we haven't looked at, is it any good? Is it well explained? I mean, I haven't opened 
the fit measures. So you could look at that and say, is this a good model? Or right. Structural equation modeling, I'm going to do all the same thing, only with everything. The latents, the circles, and all their items, all the circles and all their items. So in one sense, this could be a lot easier because I don't have to create the factor score and then create the model. I just can do it directly from the data. 